Hey cooks, a lot of people have asked me to do a Q&A and talk about my background as well as Eric. Recently, we were interviewed by Lauren Huffman, who is a Chicago-based storyteller who produces and hosts live shows around Chicago and also writes for a magazine. Um, and I thought it would be kind of interesting since people asked um, about asked us to do a little Q and A um, to add the interview to the channel just so you guys can uh, watch it and learn a little bit more about um, the both of us. So I will also leave links down in the description to Lauren's um, information so you can check her out and check out some of her writing. And if you live in the Chicago area, and maybe you can catch one of her shows. So join me for an interview with Lauren Huffman. All right, well, thanks for joining us. Uh, for the audience at home, my name is Lauren Huffman. This is Justin Flowers. Justin Hi. Flowers, and we are big fans of Amy Learns to Cook and Amy and Eric. And we are very interested in uh, Amy and Eric's personal life, the people behind the stand mixers. <laughs> so they are so gracious to let us interview them and tell us about their lives. So why don't we start from the very beginning? Eric, why don't you tell us about your childhood? Where are you from? Where did you grow up? Tell us everything. I don't know if you really want to know all that. And if I tell you, I have to kill you. Um, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so what? Born and raised in Northern California, I suppose San Francisco and then uh, Sonoma County. Then I moved to Nevada for a few years and then I went back to Sacramento and then went into the Navy for a few years. That was quite interesting. Came out, <laughs> bummed around for a few years, didn't know what I wanted to do. And then at some point I met Amy, which I'm sure will be a future question. So do you, do you know, is that good enough? All right. So you're from you're from Sacramento. Yeah. Sacramento. And then did you did you stay in that area your entire childhood? No, I, I just graduated from high school uh, yeah. that I did. I did other parts before high school. He was in Sebastopol till you were what, about 12 or so. Mm, I don't know. Ben, my like my mom and dad, they got like divorced and remarried and all kinds of crazy stuff going on. So there's basically what I refer to as before dad and after dad. I don't refer to my first dad as dad. He's just a guy I didn't like. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so that was that was like late <laughs> 70s. And then we spent maybe five years in Nevada. And that's when my mom got all remarried and stuff. And and then after that didn't work out too well. We went back to California. The recession recession in the early eighties was not helpful to us. Yeah. <laughs> it didn't, didn't work out very well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Amy, your turn. Where are you from? Where were you born? Where did you spend that beautiful childhood of yours? <laughs> um, I'm from Elk Grove, California, which is a small town. Well, at the time, it was a small town outside of Sacramento. Um, now it's like all run together and it's this big. Sprawl and crawl. Yeah, <laughs> sprawl and crawl, <laughs> crawl kind of place. Um, I went to college in Sacramento and I went to college in San Jose. Um, so I was in the Bay Area for uh, some time. Uh -huh. um, and then, yeah, pretty much spent my whole life in the same house. We lived on a small little. Well, until your mom kicked you out. Yeah. When I was 18, <laughs> I was out right now. Uh, grew up on a small, like, little farm um, and did all the little farm things. <laughs> what does that mean? What are the little farm things? Little farm things. Uh, yeah, I raised sheep. I had horses and pigs and gardens, and we had a big orchard. I was in 4-H mm. my like entire life, so mm -hmm. 
I can't say we were like, you know, we were what people now are calling kind of homesteaders <laughs> to some extent, mm -hmm. but we did that before it was homesteaders, so right? Amateur. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, hobby farm, basically. My parents had regular jobs, but we um, grew up, you know, raising fruits and vegetables. We had a huge orchard. My mom made jams. We raised our own animals. Mm. Our freezer was full of our own animals. Well, <laughs> maybe not our animals because we would like our animals would have babies and it was like, we were raising these for meat. Mm -hmm. And, um, but then us as kids, oops, sorry about that. Us as kids, we would get attached to them. So we would basically yeah. trade them with our neighbors. So the neighbors would raise animals and uh, their kids would get attached to their animals. So we would swap them and then we would, you know, butcher each other's animals <laughs> instead of our own. <laughs> Because, you know, once your kid comes attached to them, it's all over. Well, we raised them, right? So it was like, yeah. Did so. you understand that you were giving them to your neighbors to kill? Or did you think they were going to the farm to live a better life? We probably understood that, I guess. I don't know. I think we were just clueless. Yeah. That's really <laughs> funny. Oh, my God. When did you realize that you were... When did you realize that those animals were getting slaughtered? Oh, you know, it's weird when you when you when you grow up on a farm like that and you're you're like used to that sort of as a way of life. I guess you could say a way of life. You you know, I don't really know what I know I got attached to a lot of lambs that were it ended up being pets because you know they were weathered so I think they were um slated to be harvested so to speak but we sort of mm -hmm. they became pets so I mean we were small scale anyway we were small scale we had yeah you know maybe six pigs and ten sheep and you know we never had cows. The neighbor had cow, a cow, but um, we had horses that were basically pets. We had, um, you know, all that stuff. You had a dog <laughs> as a pet that was given to you to train for the handicap. Yes, we had a dog that was. Her, her brother corrupted a handicap trained <laughs> German Shepherd. The dog would, would jump out of bushes instead of walking orderly. And so they, they said, now nah, you can keep it. Yeah, we were in, we were in 4-H. So one of my brother's projects was the guide dogs. And so we got this dog and we were supposed to train them. We were supposed to do the initial so many week trainings. And then the dog would go on to further training to be a guide dog. Well, the dog was not that well behaved. <laughs> So oh, he had hit, the dog had hip problems. It was a German Shepherd, and German Shepherds sometimes yeah. have genetic hip, hip problems. So the, he flunked out for that reason, but also he was your brother. Crumb. He was not trainable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Once he left when, our when house, the, when the was, dog when the dog plays hide and seek instead of being well behaved, that yeah, really cares at this point. <laughs> oh my God, that's so funny. He Do you guys have animals now? Goofiest dog, too. No, we don't have any animals. We right actually now. do not have any animals. Our plan is we're going to buy a small hobby farm here at some point. And our goal is we're just going to be growing fruits and vegetables. We're not going to have animals. So, yeah. Yeah. So that's not, that's sort of not something I want to get into. I mean, we've had like, yeah. regular. We've had cats and dogs. Cats and dogs. And, and those when they of die things. of you know, old age, it's always sad, and I don't want to go through that again. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I know. Don't get anymore. Yeah, that's tough. But it's so hard to lose an animal. Oh. Mm -hmm. It is. It is. So we had two cats for a long time. Our cat was twenty years old. The other one was around maybe, there. The other one was maybe eighteen. Yeah. And when you're the one that's got to take them to be put down, because Boo Boo over here can't handle that. <laughs> tough, tough. Now, what yeah. was odd, strange, peculiar was after the first one 
passed away and, and there was nothing we really could do for her. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I had them take care of it. Um, the second one I took in after reading the internet saying top 10 reasons to deal with your, you know, your cat. I said, Oh yeah, he qualifies for like five or six of these things. So just mercy. I had to have him deal with. They're like, okay, it's going to cost you X dollars to do whatever. I'm like, okay, do it. And then they're like, I'm sorry, but do you want us to take care of the remains? I'm thinking, Oh, oh God. No, put them in a shoe box. I'll bring them home, right? He didn't tell me I this. I had him half buried in the front yard, and Amy opened the door. And I said, oh, oh, no. No. <laughs> digging the dig. <laughs> the other thing that got me in trouble was her, was her cat. Yeah, let's get off. Let's get on a different subject. <laughs> subject. Okay, so we both now under we have a we have an understanding of your childhood. Amy was on a farm, passing off animals to get slaughtered, and Eric <laughs> <laughs> and Eric um was basically in Northern California in Nevada for a bit, but then back to his regular Northern California. Then he went into the Navy. So you were in the Navy. Um, did you go to school after the Navy or what did you do after the Navy? Well, yeah. Well, yeah. After, after the Navy, um, I, I didn't want to go to school because <laughs> well, cause, cause I was, I was in school in the Navy and you know, it wasn't the most successful thing, right? I was in a program that has a high funk <laughs> out rate and I was really stressed, <laughs> but you know, it helped me get advanced a little faster than normal. And I still became an electrician and I still managed to get on a conventional ship, not on a nuke. And I got to be on, you know, an aircraft destroyer, aircraft destroyer, aircraft carrier. That's now a museum in San Diego, the USS Midway CB-41. And then my second mm -hmm. ship was a Spruance class destroyer, uh, DD-986. And, you know, so we were doing circles, you know, outside the Gulf during the Iran mm -hmm. war. Uh, when I was on the Midway and then on the uh, destroyer, we actually got to go into the Gulf because that was during the first uh, Gulf War. So that was that was kind of fun, I suppose. But after I got but after I got out, I said I am not going to school. I'm just I don't know. In fact, for a couple of years, I was unemployed. I didn't know what I wanted to do. It was and bombing. I was bombing. I was with my folks. My folks were just happy to have me around. You know, they were in poor health, so I'd give them rides to the doctor and. You know, go shopping and stuff. And ultimately, you know, I said, okay, I got to learn something. So I said, let's learn computers. I had no idea what I wanted. So basically, I spent a bunch of money to learn how to type. I go, wow. So I got <laughs> into the and I was bored out of my mind, but it was a job. You know, and then at some point, my folks decided they wanted to move to San Diego because that's where my sister was living. And my sister just, you know, had got married again and, you know, had some uh, kids and <coughs> take care of them. So I'm like, okay. And they're like, you want to stay here or are you going to come with us? I said, no, I'll stay here. I got a job, right? Mm -hmm. And it was only a matter of time before Amy entered my life. Um, and that frightful day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ooh. So that, that whole transition mm -hmm. period of my life from you know, before Amy and then with Amy, that's it hasn't Same been. Let me tell you, we have been together, I don't know how many years now, 23 something. And there is not one single day that poor Eric has had <laughs> to rest. No, yes, it was. And she still got on my case. I took a day <laughs> off from work, which means a day off from her, right? I could sleep if I want. Am I putting a cabinet together that's clogging up one of these rooms? No, because I don't want to. The only thing I didn't do was watch some movies. But I did go chop down a uh, cherry tree with my neighbors, and it took longer than normal. But guess what? I had fun. I fired up my chainsaw. I don't do it very often. And we had all kinds of fun. Oh, and he was he, all having a great time. And then he came over last night and was said, hey, Eric. And he holds me this, this light switch. I don't know how to hook it up. He happens to remember I was electrician in Navy, so he figured I can even save $200. I'm like, yeah, sure, I'll come over. So I had fun. That was a day off. And then after that was over, okay, back to putting the cabinet together and <laughs> demands of marriagehood, right? Marriagehood. So you, Wait. you very casually mentioned you chopped down a cherry tree. That's like a 
big to do, isn't it? That's like a big undertaking. No, not really. He, he killed his tree at a young age. The bar, the base, the base was only about this big. It spent, I spent more time trying to get my chainsaw started because I haven't run in three years. Then, eh, timber. Okay, done. Let's stop you ran that saw the other day. The other day he was chopping down a branch and it fell on the neighbor's fence. Well, that's cool. My neighbor, my neighbor is very gracious. He claims his kids broke the fence. I said, yeah, dude, but I had a heavy brand. He goes, yeah, no, I trust you, but it was pre-broken. I go, oh, so I'm actually out the hook. He goes, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> At least I didn't, you know, go there with crazy glue, say, okay, come on, fence, glue back together. You know, and the next time you you put your elbow, <laughs> crashes. <laughs> no. Nice. Nice. So, Amy, what did you do after high school? Um. For probably two years after high school, I was a total and complete bomb. <laughs> yeah. I was. We all need to be a bomb sometimes. <laughs> I was sort of in and out of college. I would go and I would drop out and I would all that stuff. And mm -hmm. I was partying like every single Ooh. night. It was. <gasps> Ooh. I was I was a hot mess. Mm -hmm. I was partying like all the time. Partying in the USA. All mm -hmm. the time. And <laughs> all of a sudden one day, I can tell you one specific day, something happened and it completely changed my life. I we were doing what we usually do was like partying, right? Like hanging out. I had an apartment and there was a bunch of people over there. People were playing dominoes and, you know, having beverages. <laughs> With solo cups? With solo cups, yeah. Of course. <laughs> and um, I don't know. It was probably like 2 o'clock in the morning or something like that. And I looked over, and I must have been, like, in my early 20s. I can't remember how old I was. And I looked around the room, and I was like, Everyone in here is in their forties, <laughs> except me and my friends. Like I had like three or four friends there, but everybody else, I looked around and I was like, everybody in here is in their forties <laughs> and they're bumming around and there. they're hanging out with us. And we're like barely 21. Right. <laughs> and the next, I'm not kidding you. This is no lie. The next morning, I went and I enrolled myself into college mm -hmm. because I thought after seeing that, I mean, those people have been over day after day partying at the house. Right. But yeah. that one single day, I don't know if it was the mad dog or what it was, <laughs> but yeah. I said, I don't want to be that. Yeah. I looked around and I was like, mm -hmm. I'm going to be 40 still sitting on this table playing dominoes. <laughs> and then I had car problems at the time and I had to like pick up a part for my engine and there's like all the people that were at my house all the time, either they had broken down cars themselves or they just were doing whatever. So I like had to hitch the bus clear across town that took me like four hours to get there and back. And I was like, this is the end. I ran and enrolled myself into college. And I felt like it was the fight for my life because I felt like if I don't go to college and get my act together, I'm going to lose my life because I'm mm -hmm. going to end up like that. So I said I was going to get A's and everything because it was, it was like a race to keep that from happening to myself. Mm -hmm. And at an undergrad I got out of 36 classes, I got 34 A's. Nice. Wow. I 34 A's. I, I think, I and think, I think after that, I was like, I, I kind of knew I wanted to go, go to law school and Something happened where somebody really influenced me that made the decision, um, my decision that I was going to then go to law school. And so just someone I met along the way sort of became a mentor of mine. 
So, um, you know, I got my, de- my undergrad degree in psychology mainly because it had the least amount of math. <laughs> Because I didn't like math. I didn't think I was gonna I was gonna do well in math. So yeah. I went to law school, first year of law school. That's when I met this the summer, old buzzer. The summer after your first year. Yeah, it was the summer of my yeah, summer after my first year. She was we like, met at a, a mutual friend's party. She was clerking at the courthouse, so she's making all kinds of money as if she was a county employee. So instead of mm-hmm. just being on financial aid. She's like, woo, I got money to spend, right? <laughs> I was having a good old time. Oh, gosh, she was having a good old time. But, but- and so we met at a, um, a friend's <clears throat> party, and <clears throat> that's uh, – after that, after I graduated law school, um, I ended up going back to school again because I guess I didn't have enough. <laughs> and I got um, – I went back to San Jose State, and I got a um, – a master's degree also in library science. Mm -hmm. So I had my BA and my JD and then I took the bar exam and I went to work for a company. And then I, while I was working there at night, I was, I worked on another master's degree. And then that that took me like three, four years because I was just taking like one class or two classes every, you know, semester well, you were working too. yeah I was working so it literally took me four years to finish my ma- that, that master's degree but and then at the same time I was getting my master's he went back and got a master's so, an MBA so what was messed up in my case was I'm trying to bum around and here she's mm-hmm. already in law school and I feel <laughs> pretty insufficient at that point right <laughs> She's got two degrees and I got zero, or at least she's. He's very competitive. So I kind of like name that tune if you remember that from the seventies, right? I'm like, how many B's did you get? She goes, I got two. I said, well, I can get mine in computer science with one B, right? And I was doing good, right? I took all these math classes. I was doing good. I was getting straight A's, and then all of a sudden, we went and got married. I got a D. <laughs> now, luckily, my dad, I, it still counts, but my GPA spiraled, and I think I lost that bet. So, yeah, that, that didn't work out too good. Um, what did you end up graduating with, the 3.5? 3.495, which rounds to a 3.5, so I still got to wear the funny tassel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So oh, cool. man. So, so Amy drug, dragged down your GPA. I dragged down his DPA. Mm-hmm. Well, and then another time his father passed away. So that was another, that was yeah, kind of I was a bad work, time. I was, yeah. working, I was working on my master's degree. I was in, not pre-med, but I was in like pre-MBA. And I had to take all these classes that I didn't take when I was in bachelor's because bachelor's, I was doing computer science, totally different track. So I'm taking all these classes and they say, you like, can only retake like one of these classes, right? I'm like, okay, I understand. Sign me up. So both my mom and dad basically went to the hospital at the same time, uh, health issues. Ultimately, my dad didn't come out. My mom did. And I didn't go to a counselor. I couldn't track anybody down. So I just said, okay, it's one class. I'll retake. And um, ultimately, um, one class told me I wasn't going to get a, 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 like a B or something that I needed to get. Or else I'm going to get kicked out of the program because in, yeah, if you got under a B in a class, you got kicked out. Yeah, right? something something like yeah, a C doesn't count anymore. <laughs> Some, something <Yeah>. like that. <laughs> you know, I guess they have higher expectations. <laughs> and so long. Well, story, a master's program, you can't get a C. That doesn't count. It doesn't. So long. <laughs> long story short, I'm taking all these classes, and the short class, one that was like an eight week class, the guy mm-hmm. basically says you're earning like a C or some weird thing. I'm like, sure, you can't bump it up a little bit? He goes, no, this is what you earned. You messed up, blah, blah, blah. And I'd already retaken one class, so I really needed this class to be higher. My other classes, I don't know what I was earning because every time I went to take a test, they screwed a bunch of stuff on there that made it look like I'm not failing, but I'm not doing very well. Later, the teacher would say, oh, this is how we filter people out of the program. I always bump everybody up a grade letter when we're all done. Well, thanks for telling me now. And she says, you sure you don't want to take, you know, keep doing this? I said, no, I basically flunked out this other guy to see. Guess what happened? After what? Christmas, and then they came out with the report card grades. 
I actually got like a B minus instead of a C or C minus or whatever. So basically, dude did get me higher than what he told me at the time, which means I didn't flunk out his class. I got credit. But because the other two classes, I said, eh, I already flunked out, so I'm messed up. I would have done okay in those classes. So I basically kicked myself out of the program because I didn't just stay the course. He ended up mm-hmm. changing his major. He's so doing... ultimately, I got an MBA with like a concentration in finance. But instead, I was doing some MIS, some computer stuff. And I don't know. So long story short, in the, in the long range, it really doesn't matter. But at that point, it was stressful, right? I hate yeah. school. And then they're saying, yeah, I'm going to kick you out because you his dad's stay. passing away my in the middle pa- of that. My dad passed away. Oh, and this is the other thing. Amy was the person who cooked the last meal for dad before he passed away. How's that? I was. And she almost burned the house down. I almost burned the house down at the same time. <laughs> we, we, it was Thanksgiving. And, my mom and was, I, my mom his was, mom was in the hospital. Dad wasn't. So I was fixing him Thanksgiving dinner. And I said, oh, I'm going to make an apple brown Betty. And the way you do that is, Easy, it's not right? like a crisp, but you make the topping and you put it out on a sheet pan, throw it in the oven. It's like buttery. Mm-hmm. You toast that off, and then you put it on top of the apples. Well, I stuck it. You're supposed to, like, broil them. Well, I stuck it in there and closed the oven. <laughs> 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 and I came back, like, 10 minutes later and opened the oven. It was like, poof! <laughs> 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 Dad was sitting in the other room, and I was like... <laughs> <laughs> so, air grabbed it, opened the back door, and threw it out in the driveway. <laughs> and we never told him. No, I don't know what happened. <laughs> I just made something else. I never told him that I almost burned his kitchen down. Kind of like the time that I cooked some chicken for you, but I was watching NBA playoffs. I forgot I had the burners all on high. And oh. Charcoal, so I turned it all off and showed him. And he said, what's for dinner? Nothing. Aren't you cooking chicken? No. Okay. I sent him out there with my chicken. And then six months later, she went. And then, like, he comes back in and he starts looking at the. He's just because we don't use our gas grill really, so he was cooking on the gas grill. And I give him the chicken. He goes outside, and the next thing I know, he's in watching the game. And I'm like, "Where's the chicken?" And he goes, "There's no chicken." And I was like, "Where's the chicken?" I don't know. You never gave me any chicken. I go out there a couple days later, open up the gas grill. And there's this thing of tin foil in there. I open it up, and it was like charcoal chicken in there. Yeah, uh, like, where's my chicken? Oh, <laughs> uh, that's good. Yeah. So, so, so yeah, we don't use we're, grills anymore. <laughs> so we're kind of in the in the in the thick of your guys's relationship. Um, can you give us uh, like an understanding of? I know you said uh, Amy that you you guys met after the. Uh, summer of your freshman your freshman year can you give us like i don't know the 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 story of how you guys met and 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 how your relationship progressed i fell in love (laughs) (sighs) well we met at a friend's birthday party and eric really couldn't like ask me out i don't know what his issue was he never would say hey you want to go see a movie or anything he wouldn't take he wouldn't do that. So he would say, like, you don't want to go here, do you? Oh, my God. <laughs> so she's taking and I said, here. and the next day I was going to take my godson, I don't know, his birthday or something, and I was going to take him to Chuck E. Cheese. And, the and I said, he said something like, you don't want to go here tomorrow, do you? And I said, well, I'm taking my godson to Chuck E. Cheese, and I got to go wash my car, so I'm going to go to the car wash across the street. And he goes, you don't want me to go, do you? <laughs> and I said, I don't know. You can meet us over there. We'll be over there at such and such time. So then, um, I mean, she wouldn't tell me where she lived up front. She told me she lived on a road that I heard of. I didn't want to tell. I didn't want to tell anybody where I live. So I just said, Oh, I live over here on such and such a street, which wasn't where I live. I lived on campus at the school. So he thought I lived over yeah, somewhere she else. Own, she had her own house or something. Like and that. I was like, 
I think about a week or two into the situation, I needed to take my car to get fixed. For some reason, I always had to take my car in to get fixed. <laughs> so I was like, hey, I was getting new brakes. So I was like, hey, can you like come drive me over there and then drop me by, back at the house? And he was like, okay. And he goes, what's your address? And I was like, this is my address. And he goes, wait a minute, I thought you lived over here. And I was like, well, I don't like to tell people where I live. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I like had a blind date and I told him, you know, I mistakenly told him where I worked. And so mm -hmm. he just like showed up there. After we were supposed to go out like in a couple days or whatever. And like the next day he showed up at my work and I was like, dude, this is why I don't Good tell one. anybody. So after that, she... Yeah, I was like, that was it. Yeah. But oh, um, man. we ended up going to this rodeo. Well, yeah, that, that we ended up going to a rodeo, and then we went to the outlet mall, and Ooh. that was the start of my whole pan obsession. Her, her really? That was so the start of my pan obsession. Your first date was the start of your pan obsession. Yes, we went. We were at an outlet mall, and I went into this little, like, kitchenware store, and they had like these huge boxes of. Right. pans like scratching their <laughs> pans they were all that old classic farberware with the black handle i like jumped into the boxes well, well i didn't have any money because i was poor back then right yeah i was a college student so i was like five dollar pans right yeah. so i came home with like a ton of that and i mean ever since then it's been just it's it's been no stopping me yeah. <laughs> So that was, was that the beginning of your cooking, your interest in cooking? Or tell us how you got into that. You know, I think that was my beginning of well, interest in kitchen gadgets. I always loved uh, dishes for some reason. I was like, I love dishes. Yeah. And that was sort of my obsession with gadgets. So, so, so for so many years... It was like I was just obsessed with kitchen stuff. I loved it. Mm -hmm. I would be in TJ Maxx or Home yeah. Goods or whatever, buying mm -hmm. all this stuff. And I never really cooked that much. I just like buying pretty dishes. Yeah. She would rather, rather look pretty than actually know what <laughs> What got us in trouble initially was me and my big mouth. You have to understand, I'm cheap, right? And I'm inherently cheap. cheap. I will spend money when I want to, but for the most part, I'm cheap. And I'm sticking <laughs> No, no, no. He is the reason for He always will say something like, you know, he's the cheap one or he's the frugal one and this is all my fault right for having so many mixers yeah, yeah but at the same time he pulls that stuff like he won't ask you on a date he won't i think he does that so it's like not his fault oh she's upset because he'll I say it will be in a store or something and he'll say you don't want that mixer do you <laughs> and then i'll say well, yeah, I do want it, but you know, <laughs> I have too many, so I just couldn't possibly buy it. And he would but, say, "Well, you know, but she goes, you kind of like it, don't you?" She blames me though. <laughs> you got two routers, you got two drills, you got one chainsaw. I'm like, yeah, you got forty mixers, five <laughs> food processors, eight, you know, all clads, <laughs> all these crock pots. Yeah, I guess maybe I do need three more chainsaws and ten table saws and stuff. He's yeah. funny yeah. though because he will like be Mister tight on the budget and then just go absolutely insane. Like Christmas is his big thing. Like he'll say, you know, oh, let's just buy each other, you know, one little thing. Let's have a little budget for Christmas. And okay, and the next thing you know, UPS shows up. Yeah. And it's like on, right? Okay, if you need a visual, imagine the Titanic. It's sinking in <laughs> the water, right? She's saying, oh, we got to be frugal, cheap, whatever. And I know there's like 8,000 things she wants, right? <laughs> and at some point, you're just going to break in half and just go down. <laughs> and that's what happens. In fact, sometimes I come home, go, hi, honey. And there's a package there. 
So that had, didn't come today. We had a phrase that things could be grandfathered in, and Amy used that very well, right? So <laughs> if he I, doesn't know when it came, that means it's grandfathered in. Yeah, exactly. There, you know, I, yeah. Only have, I only have so many days to challenge a box, <laughs> right? As if that's even going to work. So I'd be like, hey, boo, it's got tracking on it. Maybe I should just use the computer. So, oh, don't do that. <laughs> she knows that, right? But um, This is classic. Like, people always ask me, and I always tell my viewers all the time, because they look and they say, how do I get all these toys? And I tell them, this is what happens when you have two grown children so to speak that have no children right mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> right exactly it's you just a classic yeah. dual income no kids kind of situation where we have a lot of toys mm -hmm. so you know that's all i tell people is that you know I mean, that's the only reason we can do that but is Amy, because... But we, Amy turned it into more of a museum than anything. Yeah, that, that a mixer cool. museum. It is. It's, it's like the national capital, you know, pan room, right? <laughs> She's got the history. Oh, yeah. Oh, I mean, you got the bad news, right? KitchenAid's doing away with their little experience store in Ohio, right? Yeah, yeah. Did you guys hear about that? No. We've it, been out there twice. The KitchenAid factory is out in the middle of... The cornfield, out there in Greenville, Ohio. Greenville, Ohio, which is like 100 miles off the main freeway. And so you can go out there. We went out there to the factory tour, and it's pretty interesting. And in the middle of the town, they have a KitchenAid experience store where they sell all their models, all the colors, everything coming out of that factory is sold and in there. And downstairs is a museum. They have a museum, so they have all the classic, the original mixers, all the way up to the current. It's pretty interesting. The and a, the wild paint jobs, <laughs> like the one from 1976. The a lot of collectible ones. They have the Wonder Woman mixers, the one, the one that's like yeah. copper. But guess what? It costs too much to keep the store open. They're not selling because of the it. pandemic. So they they closed it. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty sad. Yeah. So it's not going to reopen. No, I don't. I think it's permanently closed. That's a bummer. That sounds like a really yeah. cool. I hope they move I, that little museum out to the factory because you can go to the factory and to I the got store. A, I got a speeding ticket driving out there because I just thought I could go 500 miles in six hours, including <laughs> a trip to McDonald's for breakfast. And mm -hmm. the cop saw my you know, out-of-state uh, plates. He just thought I was driving back to California. And I uh, said, no, no, I'm just going to Ohio. He's like, oh, <laughs> No, it was kind of fun. They have like the one of the last remaining made right sandwich stores. The ones that have like those loose meat sandwiches. There's only a few left and one is in downtown Greenville right next to the experience store. Really? Yeah. And I, I really did. hope that that doesn't close because, you know, the stream of people coming down there to go the KitchenAid thing. I hope that doesn't really affect their business too much kind of sad but yeah for sure so um how have you guys been handling the pandemic oh i don't know i'm over at dude's house last night trying to fix his switch and she's like ding ding boo where are you get out now i feel like, get out now. I feel like i'm in like the tom cruise movie or something like mi6 or something you know? get out now i'll look at be me up scotty you it's know? crazy because we've been in the house since March and yeah. the neighbor comes last night knocking on the door and I'm like, who's that? Right? <laughs> <laughs> and he opens the door and just peeks through and the neighbor's like, can you come fix my uh, light switch? And he's got a switch. And the hand. first thing I, I said, yeah, I said, they might have COVID over they there. <laughs> well, we go along the lines of everybody has. It, right? Yeah. If we're playing yeah. full defense here. I mean, yeah, she gets uh, groceries delivered by whatever. And I only go out for like emergency groceries. Like we forgot to do something or we're making a show and she needs an ingredient. 
And I'm like, why do I got to spend $35 and wait four hours when I can just go a mile down the road like a normal person and go, okay, well, we're 10 masks, please. And what about your goggles? Oh, sure. I wish I had goggles, gloves. I'm like, and then when he comes back in, I said, why don't you go get in the shower and throw your clothes in the wash? I'm like, she's never been in a store since the whole lockdown. I have not been in one single store since March. No, so she wow. doesn't even know. And I is. haven't been, I haven't went out to eat since March. So no. I told Eric, I was like, he he was like, I want to order from this barbecue place. And I was like, I made a commitment that I'm not going to eat out for an entire year. Wow. And it's been since March. So I like, this is the perfect thing to, for me to say. I did not eat out for a whole year. Yeah. Because I haven't ate out since March. So I can't eat out. Even if this thing goes totally away, I can't eat out until the first week of March. So, so did you do that because of the pandemic or is that just a personal goal of yours? You know, it started, it's, it started for me <clears throat> when I started on my cooking journey, I was like going to work. I, I eat out all the time. I was eating out two days a week, two times a day yeah. sometimes. You had to get breakfast mm-hmm. in the morning. I got breakfast in the morning. I ate out for lunch. And then usually I don't really eat that much dinner because I just eat like a decent lunch. So I'd, mm-hmm. I might just eat like a quick sandwich for dinner because I get a home commuting. You don't get home till like 7.30. You're just mm-hmm. dragging into the bed, right? So it's like peanut butter and jelly and into the bed, right? So my main meals were breakfast and lunch, and I I literally was eating out almost every day, both of those mm-hmm. meals. Mm-hmm. And I said, I have all this kitchen stuff that I bought. I have bread <laughs> machines coming out the wazoo. I got pans yeah. all over the place. I need to teach myself how to cook. It's time. I was 40. Mm-hmm. I was the age that when I was sitting at that table playing dominoes, yeah, I was to get out of here. Now I'm 40 years old. And to be honest with you, I could, I could basically only cook like three or four things. I could cook pizza. Uh-huh. I had worked in a pizza parlor as a teenager. I can make this egg scramble. I was always good at making scrambled yeah. eggs. Right. And well, I could always make like, you know, your average like grilled turkey sandwich. <laughs> Me, I can make a pimper and jelly sandwich and He can it. nuke a, a I, Salisbury steak yeah, TV I can, dinner. I can nuke a mean TV dinner. <laughs> so So that- I was like, I need to get out for I think I made that decision for a host of reasons. I didn't I didn't necessarily say, Oh, I'm gonna start cooking from from home because I thought it was going to be a money saving thing because to be honest with you, it hasn't been a money saving thing. I didn't necessarily say I'm going to cook from home because I want to cook healthier. Cause obviously I didn't do that. Right. I think some of it was that number one, I had all this kitchen stuff that I spent all this money and all these years and I wanted to learn how to do it. And I think, for me, I've always been my entire life. I will let things go to, how can I say this? I can let things go to hell in a handbag, right? For years and years and years. And I will get Mm -hmm. something on my mind that I will say, I will make a decision. And it's the same thing when I went to college, I can flounder around for years and years, and then I will suddenly make a decision that I'm going to do something. And then, you can't and then from there, I'm like, I go for it like 1,000 miles per hour. I've always been like that. Either I do it 1,000 miles per hour or I don't do anything. <laughs> yeah. There's no in-between for me. I don't usually waffle like, a hundred miles an hour, do some, uh, do it. Okay. It's either all or nothing for me. And mm-hmm. and that's how I was when I started college, I went from nothing to, I got to get straight A's. And I think I went that with my cooking. I said, just one day I said, I have all this cooking stuff. I don't know how to cook. I'm 40 some years old. I'm going to teach myself how to cook. 
I'm going to teach myself how to cook. Mm -hmm. People will tell me, oh, I don't want to make this recipe. There's too many ingredients or it's too difficult. And I always tell them, if you want to learn how to make X dish, an X dish requires you to have these ingredients or devote this amount of time to learn how to do that. Pick a few things. Don't try to learn how to cook everything in the world. Mm -hmm. I pick something like, I want to learn how to make, I love eggs Benedict. I want to learn how to make the best hollandaise sauce that I ever can make. So start out in January, we got the new year coming out and you can say, I want to learn how to make by the end of the year. These are my goals. I want to learn how to make the best flipping lemon meringue pie that you can make. I want to learn how to cook a fantastic steak. Mm -hmm. I want to learn how to make pie crust and a Dutch apple pie. And I want to learn how to, what do you want to learn how to make? You actually learn how, or maybe learn how to make gravy. Because when I made I didn't know how to make gravy. I think that was one of the first things. Like, I want to learn how to roast a chicken and make a gravy. Mm -hmm. And you have to do it a lot. Yeah. Before you get good at it. Mm -hmm. People will do it once or they'll do it twice. People that are great, that make the world's best chili and everybody in the family knows it's because they've made 40 pots of chili. Right. <laughs> and all of them are terrible. So make a decision. Like if I want to learn how to make the best roast chicken, mashed potatoes and gravy, I am going to say one twice a month or three times a month, I'm going to roast a chicken and make the gravy. And mm -hmm. once you do it five, six, seven times, you will get better and better and better at it. And by the end of the year, that list that you made, you haven't learned to cook everything. But what you've done is you've, you've said, I want to learn how to make these five things at the highest level that I can learn to make that and strive for that. And by the end of the year, not only have you learned to make five things fantastically, if you do that every year, three years, you're going to have 15 dishes, right? But you learn the techniques along the way that you can say, oh, I can make roast chicken. So now can I translate that into beef? Now I can make a beef gravy instead of a chicken gravy. So that gives you the skills to go on to the next one. It doesn't take as long then to develop your next fabulous recipe because you're learning these techniques all the way along. She's too mm -hmm. There's some families that can't cook, period. And the <clears> people <throat> that really don't know how to cook think the ones that half try to cook, oh, they're the best. It's not until you actually go to somebody who knows it. Oh, my God, you're the best. What happened to people? Oh, so it's, it's all great. Anybody great. can learn to cook. It's not like painting where you have to have some kind of artistic eye. It's right. not like singing where you have to be born with some level of a voice. You can train it, but if you can't sing, like yeah. ain't no training going to help you, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Cooking is something that there are formulas to do it. If you want to learn to bake bread, you can learn to bake bread. The only reason yeah. you're not learning to bake bread is because you haven't got in there and practiced. And you're going to make a loaf after loaf, and it's going to be junk. Mm -hmm. Just throw it away and make another one, right? Yeah. Every yeah. time you do that, you learn. And I'm going to tell you, go out and buy you. I always tell people, go to Sam's Club or Costco, buy one of these 25-pound bags of house brand flat bread flour and some yeast and get in there and make bread and make mm -hmm. bad bread and bad bread and it'll get better and better. And when you bake your way through that 25-pound sack, which is only about 10 bucks, mm -hmm. you will be able to bake. So don't just constantly do the same recipe all the time that fails right mm -hmm. but once you bake your way through that 125 pound sack of flour you will be able to make great bread great basic bread right from there once you learn that you go on to the next one so mm -hmm. so i think i approached learning to cook as yeah I want to learn to cook, but I, I want to learn like 
like my tagline is learn to cook one recipe at a time because it I seems like, like a huge universe. So yeah. pick one dish that you want to master and cook it till your little heart is <laughs> a little heart out, right? <laughs> and change it every time and take a re- start with one recipe. Print out print out five recipes and combine them into the things that you like and make a pot. And eat it and feed it to other people and say what do you like about this? What do you don't like about this? What do you think I should change? Oh, it needs a little heat, more heat, more sweetness, more this. Okay, the next time I'm going to take that, I'm going to change it a little bit, and I'm going to make it again. Just don't give it to six different people because you probably get six. Yeah, well, answers, chili. You're like, this tastes good, but then this tastes horrible. Okay, it's chili. Horrible, make up your minds. How about you two fight each other out? Yeah, don't do that with chili. That's chili, what, you'll never That's get. what hurts about competition, barbecue, and competition, yeah. and chili. Everybody claims they can make the best chili, and that's fine. They make chili that they like. Some people basically make stew, and they call it chili. You know, mm-hmm. they have their idea of chili. So when you get in those competitions, you got to leave out the beans and other stuff. If you get in other competitions, it's okay to use ground beef as opposed to making the perfect little cube. And guess what? If it's 3 in the morning and you're slicing and you make a square, the judge goes, nice squares. <laughs> But guess what? Guess what? Oh, yes. When you are cooking in your house for yourself and your family, that's your pot of chili. You own there's you own that kitchen. There are not very many places on this earth that you get to control. Yeah. You don't get to control your well, I mean, to some extent. But I mean, you're on the job and you're always answering to somebody. Either it's your boss, your customer, your somebody. Mm-hmm. You're at home in your kitchen. You are the master of your kitchen. Yeah. Right. If that's how you like to eat it. Don't let anybody on the internet, don't let <laughs> any of your neighbors tell you you can't put de- beans in your chili. If you want <laughs> beans in your chili, put them in there. That's how you like to eat it, right? <laughs> yeah. Because there's a it's your dish. Because it's eating chili. You want to eat it. Competition chili generally is not meant to be eaten. Yeah, if you're cooking for someone else, like if you have him, he's like, like my dad doesn't like onions. He likes them cooked, but not raw. So I guess he's controlling the dish to some extent if I'm cooking for him. But I don't know. You always hear on this, and you get that. You know, when you put yourself out there, you know, if you if you're thinking about starting a YouTube channel or a blog or something like that, and you put yourself out there like that, you're always going to get people that say, "I get it every single day." Why would you put that in that dish, right? You know, right. You know, and my you know, answer is because it's mine, and that's how I like it. But you know, yeah. if you don't like it that way, you can, you know, take my recipe or don't take my recipe. Follow it or not. Take that out or not. Take it out. That it's mm-hmm. your kitchen. But this is my advice. You're doing well when you get criticism. Why? That means yeah. you've reached a level that the general trolls have found you. <laughs> so they yeah. go, why are you doing that? <laughs> yeah, you should got to be nice. And, well, this is what I mean. You feel like saying, delete, damn. That's what you feel like doing. <laughs> but, you know, if you just have your own little foodie group and they say, oh, Amy, that's great. I love you. You know, and we love that. We really do. But, it's, yeah. it's tough. But, but you do get some criticism. You're like, how did I get a hundred thumbs up and three thumbs down? Three people don't like chicken, or they just don't like wearing chicken. Did I stutter? Right. I stutter? They don't like your hair. That's what someone who said. I love your recipe, but you know, I really don't like your hair. <laughs> Is this a what? video about you my hair? You do with everything. I mean, God. You've right. made it. Man. You've made it. You've that's made it. the truth. That's the truth. If they're starting to come attack your anything physical, you've made it. So congrats. Yeah. <laughs> I love your hair. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> Our single so, greatness and not really embarrassment, but a learning opportunity was when Amy made her, you know, how to make scrambled eggs because uh, a, viewer, yeah. a viewer a long, long time ago asked her, hey, I don't know how to make scrambled eggs. Can you make a video on it? So Amy made a certain technique. The problem was she talked for about six minutes. It was two, one of my first videos. It was one of her first videos. She did two minutes worth of cooking, 
Nobody complained that our cooktop was look at the Titanic back in those days because it was yeah, it was not old level. cooktop. No one made fun of. We had no idea what white balancing meant because it was, it was orange. orange. <laughs> the audio could have been better, but they criticized us because she made six eggs for an unknown number of people, and then even when I showed up at the end, they didn't know who I was because they'd already flipped it by then. They thought she ate all six. Mm. And um, the big problem of the whole thing was is she didn't just go on and say, blah, 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 this is how you do it, and be done. But she kind of explained how important it was because it's for beginning cooks. Now, if you don't care, mm -hmm. you don't watch it, fast forward. Yeah, whatever. that's – I mean, oh. some of the criticism I've got, especially when the whole tasty wave sort of came around, is why, why I don't just put a camera there and boom, boom, boom. And I always, you know – I could do that. But there's also 8 million ways to make something. In the egg video, she didn't add cheese. She didn't add anything really to it other than just keep it very simple. People are like, you can nuke it. You can add milk. You can add cream, all kinds of – well, she doesn't add any of that because, A, she's allergic to the stuff. But if you want to add water, if you want to nuke it, if you want to put it into a milkshake machine for 10 minutes, then do it. But that's not what she's teaching you. So, yeah, I don't know. People, I think that um, act like, oh my God, Amy, I watched your video. Can I add this to it? They and I think I, sometimes they don't necessarily understand that my videos for me are hobby videos. Like I have a regular career outside of YouTube. You yeah. know what I mean? Right. And I, I'm, I wish I could upload on a, on a exact schedule, like every Monday, Saturday, whatever, you're going to get a video at two o'clock. I wish I could upload more. I have a lot of requests to do videos and I really wish that I could get to all of those, but and we you know, to, and we have to learn how to cook first. See, this yeah. Is, the this process is, is I'm learning to cook. So if someone tells me, you know, yeah. can you make, you know, whatever. It's like, yeah, I would love that, but I got to learn how to do it. So, yeah. and then I have to learn how to make it my own. So sometimes it'll take me some amount of time just because I I only have a, a limited amount of time to put out videos. Um, so, I mean, that's a and challenge. And you got to clean up your own messes too, right? What was that? And you've got to clean up your own messes too. Oh right? yeah, I got to clean up. Yeah, nobody sees no, that part. No, there, there are. We never clean up messes. <laughs> and Amy learns to cook here. There's never a mess. It just <laughs> mysteriously disappears. <laughs> you open up the cabinet. The dishes are all there, like they've never yeah. been missing. Yeah. You never see the dishwasher, right? Yeah. So a lot yes. of people tell me, like, "Oh, your kitchen's so clean all the time." And my kitchen is generally clean, but also when I'm done filming. There are times where my kitchen is an absolute disaster, oh, yeah, the like every other kitchen and like every other, yeah. you know, nothing on TV is, is, is real life. Yeah, that's not real life yeah, when you plus, go in plus, and it's plus, magic is television. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Plus, plus they a lot of times food TV, you know, they've got multiple kitchens. So even though you might see the set mm -hmm. looks clean, they're really cooking mm -hmm. behind the person and then they just mm -hmm. bring it out to say here, voila, right? Yeah. You know, totally. So this is my real live kitchen that I live in, and it does turn into an absolute disaster area at times. Um and if we're cooking some food for ourselves and then we got to clean it up before we got to film, guess what? It does take time to set up, right? The yeah. Lights, the camera, the audio, and we got to clean the kitchen or have it at least out of the view so that way we can focus on cooking, which is another thing of Amy. She wants you to cook with a clean kitchen with just what you need because you don't want to be looking for things yeah. while you're in the act of cooking, right? Yeah. But with us, we're filming. So when we film, everything takes two to three times as long. Why? Because when you cook, right, you just go in the kitchen, you go in the um, refrigerator, grab what you need, and you start doing it. Here with us, we're like, okay, we got to do this and explain it, do this and explain it, do this and explain it. When in real life, you can maybe do two things at once, but it's kind of hard for us to show cameras and because it's hard for us to multitask when we're trying to do it, right? Yeah. So. It's a lot more challenging than I ever thought it would be. Yeah. It's a lot more difficult. Oh, for sure. You guys make it look so easy, but... <laughs> Everybody <laughs> always says it, like, it looks so easy. And I'm like, 
there's so much that goes behind the scenes yeah. that you see. So you mentioned that it takes you, you have to learn how to cook something. It takes, you have to make it terribly until you finally make it well. So for each of your videos, what would you say is an average amount of time you take to learn each recipe? You know, it depends. I think now it doesn't take me as much as it did at one point because <clears throat> I'm getting more to the point where because I've developed a lot more skills, I can say, oh, I want to make this dish. I can break down the components by looking at it, by tasting it. And I can say, you know, I can put the dish together in a way now that I couldn't do it before. Um, Sometimes when you cook yeah. something, the plate can fall apart. Maybe the sauce comes out too thin, comes out too thin. Mm -hmm. And when you've been playing around a little bit longer, you kind of know, oh, okay, you know, mm -hmm. this isn't going to work. Either my pan's too big, too small. I need to add more, add less. I know how to thicken by now. We're back. Yeah. In, in my originally, my thicken. cooking journey was if I said I was going to make like braised chicken with sauce over rice or pasta or with vegetables or something like that, I would have to cook it over and over and over again. So I get the sauce with the right amount of liquid, reduced amount of time, thickened to where it comes together in the dish at the end where I want it to be. Now I can, because I already have that skill where I can do that, I don't, you know, I could take that same kind of dish and turn it into something else pretty easily. Well, back in the day. Mm -hmm. I can take a mushroom chicken or a piccata or something like that and take out the mushrooms and then the um, and add tomato and turn it into tomato sauce, add pasta and make it into you know, a chicken and pasta dish. Well, back in the day, how many people used uh, cream of mushroom soup to add the rice or whatever? Yeah. Now she's actually making chicken piccata with wine and stuff. Yeah. And she knows how to take the mushrooms out. Oh, yeah, you got to watch that video. We we, in, intentionally, well. we intentionally double the recipe so we get more gravy because gravy is good. Yeah, gravy is good. Yeah, <laughs> But one of the things on your yeah. own personal cooking journey, if you're not a cook or you're just starting your journey, mm -hmm. if you take something simple like a chicken piccata or a braised chicken and mushrooms or something like that, and you learn the process of doing that, that skill then goes to any other kind of dish where you, you know, you start a, you sort of, you know, brown off something, braise it, and then create a sauce. So you can turn that into a beef dish, a chicken dish, pork chops, some other pork chops, um, well, yeah. anything. Well, see, that's one thing. See, as long when you learn that skill, you and you can take that to anything. I mean, you can take it to a stir fry. Once you mm -hmm. learn how to do that, then you just cook off some chicken, cook some vegetables, boil your noodles, throw them in, put a sauce in, thicken it with the cornstarch slurry, and now you have a stir fry. So you went from <laughs> making chicken piccata, you learned that skill to making a stir fry. It's sort of the same thing. Yeah. Community yeah. College, I was taking some cooking classes there. Uh, one of her instructors was a master chef. And to be a master chef, you have to know like 10,000 recipes. <laughs> yeah. But she was saying, he said something like, well, when it comes to animals, whether it be cow, pig, you know, chicken, whatever, a lot of parts are common. So if you know how to make this dish using this animal, just multiply times four or five mm -hmm. with different animals, boom. So it's not like you got to know really 10,000. Yeah. You can divide it by four or five depending upon how many animals you involve. I thought huh. that was interesting. He was like, we, we were like questioning him and he was like, like for the exam, you have to know thousands of recipes. And he said something like, just go down the animal, right? If you learn how to roast and you have, a cow, you start at one end of the cow and go to the other, right? Mm -hmm. That's like how many different kind of roast cuts can you get when you learn how to braise it? You learn how to fry it. You learn how to do this. So it's more like learning the technique. Then you can apply it and make, you know, a million different recipes. So sometimes when I'm cooking, it's kind of hard to write a recipe when you get to the point where, you learn you you when you learn from the technique instead of learning from you know this specific recipe because if you learn how to do stir fry 
open up your refrigerator and throw in whatever you have. It's the same technique. And then to say, it's difficult then to say, okay, how do I make that as a recipe? Because I really don't know how much I used of each ingredient. <laughs> or maybe next time you make it, you don't have the same ingredients or you never make the same dish. That's That can be difficult. Maybe yeah. when you do that, have a note. When I do that, sometimes I have notes. So I start with what I think is a recipe. So I'll say, hmm, let's say I want to make meatloaf. So I think I need this, 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 this. And then when I make it that time and maybe I add something different, write that note, write that each time. It's kind of fun. Maybe I have a little notebook and write the progression of your famous meatloaf dish, right? Like and what me, the re, re, iterations that you go through. But like me, for example, I don't really eat beef a ton, right? I eat mostly chicken because that's what she does. So she's going to be like I think it's <laughs> off her. But the other day, you know, I'm going to the supermarket and they want $34 for a four pound roast. I'm like, really? Wow. But then they said, oh, half off, only seven times. I was like, oh, I, had to <laughs> I love chuck roast, right? And she's like, oh, I'll put it in a slow cooker. I'm like, oh, I'm going to slow cooker. I'm putting a sous vide. Now I've already done a 27 hour sous vide. I'm like, can I get it? Uh, butter knife tender in 18 hours and the answer is unfortunately no you really got to cook for about 30 hours to get that tender that's um, crazy but it was still tasty why because, barbecued it after yeah because because it's still it's still a blob of meat i mean i just i just slammed a bunch of montreal steak seasoning on it right i put it into a, a food saver bag ziploc bags work well too and then i just let it rip for in my case 18 hours it still came out pretty good, right? It was still nice and pink on the inside. Then I threw it on the Weber for maybe 10 minutes. I flipped it, you know, each side five minutes maybe, and it was done. And it was great. Okay, so I needed a steak knife. Wham. But it was still It's funny, flavorful. though, because I say to him, I say, he says, oh, I'm going to cook. And I'm like, I, he always, like, constantly asks me 2,000 questions about cooking and i say eric you know how to cook no, I don't. and he'll always say no he doesn't i don't he does he yeah, knows yeah. a lot more than he acts like he does like i don't know how to cook anything i mean but, I, know, I know that if i want a little smoke on my on my web or i'll just throw a, a, an apple chunk in there see he he and the next thing you know, what's I funny is when we first met through. he didn't cook he tried to cook me a pork roast and he yeah, didn't no, cook at all Yes. And now, even after all these times, all these times where I said, and I was worried about that. Like, I was like, my hobby has pretty much taken over his life. Yeah, because now. You know, I was worried about that because I was like, I was like, what is your market? hobby? I don't want it to seem like, you know, this is just our oh. our house oh. is the amy show you know well, what i mean well, not, not like just, it's all amy's well, hobby not just a show but it's it's but i'm gonna tell you it's just as much his hobby as it is mine barbecue now. and and chili competition you think you can just ride on down the road and do your own little thing <laughs> yeah take your own little crock pot yeah have fun but if you're gonna stay at a hotel just so that you can get up early and stuff and you've got ten thousand gadgets with you you know how much we stunk up a hotel room mm. making some fresh <laughs> salsa. Oh, God. And she won. And we would have gone to Omaha for the national if it wasn't for my boss at the time. Wouldn't let me go because he wouldn't let me take time off because the consultants didn't want to cover the help desk for me. And he says, how are you going to answer tech support calls, Eric? I'm like, oh, my cell phone? <laughs> I-80. There's good corridor for reception. Goes, oh, oh, my God. Mm. The right answer. And because of that, she didn't go to Nebraska. Yeah. God, but we stunk up that hotel. We had fresh it's his. You see that? Do you see that? The pepper. It's it's oh, his know. hobby as much as it How is. How would mine. you like to be a man? And I like that wow. because when this started, How would you like? I thought this was like, oh, my hobby is just taking over his life. Mm -hmm. And oh, my gadgets. He just has to deal with my gadgets because, you know, when you. When you're in your relationship, you have to take whatever that whatever surrounding that person, and what's surrounding that me is a whole <laughs> bunch of pans, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I feel bad about that, but also too, when he does say stuff like "You don't want that, do you?" I think that's his way of like I know he does want it. 
Yeah. Really like of course it. he wants it. Sometimes I have to confirm stuff. Like when we're going to Sam's Club, <laughs> she sees a row of kitchen, eight mixers, <laughs> you know. And I can tell if they're not $400, she probably wants one, even though these days they seem not to be as good as they were in the past. But still, for $200, she's willing to take a chance. So when she says something like, wow, that's kind of pretty, I make a little mental note, right? And then when Christmas kind of comes and goes, and she's like, I didn't get a mixer, did I? I go, I think Santa has something in the other room. Let's go see. And sure enough, here's, here's a late Christmas present. And boom, I got Christmas for her because she didn't think she's going to get it. But guess what? A, I remembered. And B, I messed with her. I made her think she wasn't going to get it. Yeah, he did think of it. I, I do that from time to time. I do that back at him, too, because his birthday rolled around and he was like, oh, I want to get this drone. And it's like two grand. And, uh, and I was like, oh, that's just too much for a drone, right? You're going to. Crash it. You're going to crash it into the river the first time you use it. That's 2000 bucks flying straight into the river, right? And he was like, oh, I guess. And then his birthday came around and I was like, ooh, guess what the birthday was? Oh, yeah, my, my little ears <laughs> all perked up. You know, you know, you go from being this like, I'm not happy. All of a sudden, ooh, now my heart feels so lifted. But then mm -hmm. came around and yeah. pretty much made us... I mean, I can go to the park down the street and fly it or something, but if I want to do what I really want to do, which is go to like the different rivers, the different mountains, different cities, fly it at night, fly it during sunrise, and actually have like my own channel where I actually show from a cinematographic point of view, you know, kind of like mm -hmm. you know, really cool footage. Like that's what I ultimately want to do. Of course, it took me three hours to shoot an intro for an unboxing <laughs> video because I couldn't make up my mind. The back of the truck had too much sunlight. The tree was beautiful, but I couldn't get the whole tree because it shows my front of my house. So I got just a trunk. And ultimately, I'm doing from the side of the house. And, there's a, and of course, the neighbor girl, eight million questions. Uh, very, very, very nice neighbor. And she's really cute. And she's like, Eric, I watch every show. I didn't see your drone. Where is it? I'm like, uh, I don't have a channel yet. Oh. <laughs> She's waiting on to have some videos. Um, I don't know. I don't even know what I'm going to call it. So long story short, I am developing something, but it will be. Oh, that's really cool. I'm glad that he's doing it. So it's not just like, I feel like, you know, yeah, it's like feels, my hobby took well, over yeah, his life. She feels partially left out, but the other problem I'm going to have is, is I need her as a shooter because I'm going to be sitting there controlling it, right? And it's <laughs> going to be shooting like band and side stuff, but I need her shooting the other camera looking at it. So you kind of go back and forth. What's the drone seat and what's the background and stuff look like, right? I'm going to be your key it. grip. And I, yeah, she needs to be my camera. Person. But you know what? When we film our cooking shows and she does like 90% of them, thank God. And the few that I do, you know how much fun it is when she's the camera lady? Because she <laughs> needs to get back at me. She goes, second for sound, rolling, ready. I'm like, just be quiet for two seconds. Like, <laughs> the phone, I'm like, action. I mean, I got to yell. I'm, I'm the talent. I got to yell action just to get her to hush. <laughs> That's great. So if you could leave your viewers with one ounce of advice, what would you tell them about cooking or life, really? Just do it. Yeah. <laughs> just do it. Just if you want to learn to cook, just cook it. Just, just cook it. it. And don't worry if you make mistakes. So many people are worried about not doing everything a hundred percent right. And it doesn't right. come out like it comes out on Pinterest. Forget Pinterest. Right. Just cook it mm -hmm. and cook it again and cook it again. It's not, it's your food. It's your kitchen. You are the boss of it and just mm -hmm. go for it. It's just ingredients. And even if it doesn't come out 100%, it yeah. will still be good. It'll be, it'll be, but the worst thing that you ever cook is better than anything you can go out and buy in a restaurant. Because, 
You cooked it with love. It's yours. <laughs> you cooked it. Yeah. It's it's better than anything you can go out there and get, even if it's a disaster. Because you mm-hmm. so just just cook it. Get that pan out. Right. Turn on the stove and put something in it. You got stuff in your refrigerator. Just get yeah. there and cook it. <laughs> so it's what's up Wednesday. What's up Wednesday is your um your scheduled video. And then you usually do one or two others as well, right? Yeah, what's up Wednesday? <laughs> we have to we have to have it. It's an act of God. <laughs> I thought if I don't have it out by even, a certain even, time. Even if it's Tuesday night and we haven't filmed <laughs> one yet and she's tired, we still have to roll it out because I have to edit it, then she has to edit it, get it uploaded, add her little funky stuff to it, and then at some point Wednesday morning, prior to COVID, there used to be people that when they commute to work. They, they love to watch it while they're commuting. Now that we got COVID in effect, I don't know if the same people are commuting or work from home. Because if I didn't have it up there by a certain time, they were like, oh, I was on the train and I couldn't watch it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it also keeps me on, you know, I think if I didn't have What's Up Wednesday, there would probably be weeks where I would say, oh, I'm too tired or oh, I'm too. It yeah. keeps me going too because I'm like, I have to get the Wednesday video done. People want to see it and they ask for it and they hold me to it. So all my other videos come out, I guess, when I can get them out. I usually have something Monday or Tuesday. Sometimes like this week I have something for Sunday. I'm never never consistent just because of my work. Yeah. Yeah. But um I mean for me I also am I'm you know because it's pretty much a hobby for me. So I mean there will be a point That's where, why where, I'm where, like where, okay, where Wednesday I can commit to and there's some weeks that I'll only have one other video and there's some weeks that I'll have four. Historically we've done two a week. If you look at the long term, a lot of months she only puts out eight videos. The better month, she puts out 12. We've never done 15 or 20. That's really mm-hmm. time-consuming, and she has a regular full-time job. Yeah. But there will be a time where that won't be the case, and she will then be putting Yeah, out there will be a time when so that yeah. won't be the case. Um, as long as um, you are... Uh, you stick, you stick, you will stick, be you retiring stick, at some point. Schedule, but you need to stick to a schedule. Then I have to stay like... <laughs> <laughs> hey, don't ask, don't ask what happened when she sold real estate and she was no longer tied to a years gas. ago. Yeah, <laughs> what happened, boo? Uh, I don't know. Shopping, you, you, you butterfly. <laughs> uh, I'm free. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I think I think I know you guys a lot better, and I think your viewers are going to know you a lot better. Is there anything else you want? you to say before we before we close out the holidays are coming yeah if if you ever wanted to learn to cook a new dish now is the time the holidays are coming if you're not going to be cooking at home and you're going to well ordinarily you would go somewhere else mm-hmm. right i don't know this yeah. year well amendment to what she just said mm-hmm. if you've never cooked something before don't wait till the holidays to do it because you don't want try to try it in time. advance. Yeah, practice. Yeah, them. try something that you've only made from packaged ingredients. Try to make it fresh. If you've always made green bean casserole out of a can, try to make a fresh version. Try to make yeah. stuffing. Try to roast a turkey. If you don't like turkey, roast a chicken, right? Try one thing new this year for both Christmas and Thanksgiving. We'll be taking that advice. Mm-hmm. We'll be taking okay. that advice. We're going to find something from your channel and make it and learn. <laughs> to- awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I'm excited. In hindsight, one of my more favorite recipes from a practical purpose was Amy strawberry jam. Um, just by volume. It rarely makes it on the peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Most of the time it ends up, Drinking it out. <laughs> he just eats it. Really? 
Oh my god. That's so funny. Oh my gosh. Oh yeah, she 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 she'll and she'll down it. He just takes a spoon and forget the bread. Or, uh, or or if you have some lemonade, right? Just mix uh, half, yeah, half put and it half. In or into make some a lemonade. Strawberry syrup. lemonade. Strawberry lemonade. Oh. Ooh, that sounds really good. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. That we will be trying for sure. Yeah, yeah it's really good. Well, thank you guys for your time. It was time. great talking to you. Yeah. It was fun. You guys are great. We love you and we watch you all the time. Thank you. Are- you. We appreciate it. Thank you. We have a great holiday. We got you too. Thanksgiving's going to be here in like a couple weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Mm hmm. Crazy. I know. It's crazy. This <laughs> year is weird. Crazy. But- all right. Well, have a great rest of your day and we will talk to you soon. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.